And here in uh, a single family house on the Upper East Side of Manhattan, um, we were invested in developing sort of a through line between digital design methods um, uh, and techniques and artisan material processes um, that include the forming and sculpting of ceramics, um, as in the case of the terracotta facade system that you see here, um, metal fabrication in the case of the stair with a braided bronze railing um, and faceted wood treads and sort of decidedly parametric geometry, um, and robotic milling as in the case of this carved and lacquered wood ceiling. Um, so for us like in, in this project in particular, and maybe kind of in general, um, craft and, and sort of craft processes are really thought of as a way of, of bridging between the historic context that we often find ourselves working in and the sort of contemporary life um, of, of our clientele. Um, so uh, uh, Charles and Ray Eames were fond of saying that, that the, the details are not the details, they, they really make the design. Um, and the, the, practices, the practice of the Eameses is, is one that I've always held personally as a kind of aspirational model. Um, for the wide ranging and diverse set of interests that it encompassed and also their sense of play, but also their ability to reach across disciplines and bodies of knowledge um, in each project. And so here in a series of studies in plywood, first their, their molded leg splint for the US Navy that, that actually required the declassification of a number of, of adhesives um, in order to make possible, which sort of led to patented techniques that they developed for forming plywood around holes cut in flat sheets um, to their famous rubber shock mount welded to the back of their plywood and fiberglass chairs that um, was at once flexible but also allowed for the fastening of the metal frame uh, to the smooth seat and back without having to drive a, a screw through the, through, the, through the face of the formed surface. And the, the rubber welding technique is one that was being used at the time to assemble automotive dashboards and is part of a an even larger project of the Eames is to connect the manufacturing techniques and engineering expertise from the war effort um, and its associated technological advances uh, sort of into the, and bring those to bear in the, in the post-war design of, of housing and consumer products. So it's a detail in the sense of that it's an enlargement or a kind of articulation of, of note that makes, that sort of makes the design aesthetically and experientially but it's also a gateway between, between worlds and bodies and knowledge. Um, and so we've really tried to build a practice where our ability to bring together many different voices and facilitate and empower the work of others is truly central to the, to the work. And interestingly enough, interiors have afforded the opportunity to pursue that objective in sort of some incredibly surprising and satisfying ways um, because there are so many individual design elements and potentials for collaboration. And because the standards for performance and for quality and for detailing are so high. So um, here in the dining room of a, of a Park Avenue apartment, we have a space that is meant to function as a library, as a family and dining, as a family dining space, and also as a formal entertaining space. Um, we have a, a long-standing collaboration with the Hudson Valley sculptor, Christopher Kurtz, um, with whom we created this table. Um, that is uh, made of oxidized cherry and aluminum that's been cold forged into a into sort of like a rippling lasagna noodle surface. Um, and the, the table is the table is meant to sit against the wall most of the time, um, you know, against this 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 banquette. Um, but then it's brought out into the center of the room and expanded with leaves to seat 14 when the family entertains. And we we also uh, collaborated with um, with the designers Ladies and Gentlemen Studio, who are based in, in Red Hook, um, to create this chandelier with a stainless steel reflector um, and an uplight and a, a pendant, a drop pendant in slumped glass. The chandelier rotates 180 degrees um, in the room so that it so that the drop is always centered on the table, irrespective of what position it's in, whether it's kind of tucked in or if it's at the center of the room. And so, like as in the case of many of our interiors. The design here emerges less through the singular vision of an individual author, let's say, um, and more from, from the curation and cultivating of relationships with other designers and creators, um, where our role as the architects or kind of principal designers is really more to create opportunities um, and technical support for others, and then, to, and then to sort of get out of the way and let them run with, their, with the opportunity. 
Um, here in the penthouse structure of a, of a townhouse on the Upper East Side, um, we were working with the artist Sarah Oppenheimer to create a site-specific artwork that we commissioned when the building was still in schematic design. Um, Sarah's work really plays with and expands the sort of gray zone between artwork and environment. Um, and this is one of the very first of her works to be permanently incorporated into the high performance um, envelope of a building. So it became, uh, and sort of as such, it became a, a central element in organizing the structural and other technical aspects of the building, um, as well as the volume um, and form of the addition from a, from a zoning perspective. So the piece is a, is a kind of a hinge that introduces a skewed angle um, around which these other systems are then sort of organized. Um, but fundamentally what, what Sarah's piece really, what it really does is it, is it projects a sliver of sky into the space below through a skylight um, incorporated into the roof terrace and optics that, are, that produce an effect that is at once entirely visually beguiling um, but that also begins to really kind of confound the line between inside and outside where the glass rooftop structure meets a 19th century base building. Michael, this yeah. is so beautiful. Um, before you move on to the next, um, there is a small window that says that's like build order. If you could minimize that, we could see the slide. It hasn't been particularly disruptive, but. Really? This little um, that guy. Now it's gone. Try, sorry. Try um, Max playing again. Yes. Yeah, it's like the the one the many wonders of Zoom. Yes, exactly. Um, now it's gone magically. Right. Thank Super. you so much. Super. Um, all right. Um, so uh, in that same Upper East Side project, we also had this really special collaborative opportunity um, that emerged out of the client's request for a vertical garden. Um, so vertical gardens are notoriously difficult and maintenance intensive, um, particularly in environments like the Northeastern United States where there are large swings in the climate um, between summer and, and the winter. So we approach the design of this garden through kind of a hyper-local lens, um, which started as shown on the left um, with a really detailed environmental analysis um, where we were measuring and simulating a, a series of variables like humidity, temperature, solar exposure, um, and the like, um, in order to construct a, a very a highly detailed ecological profile that was sort of unique to the, to the facade and its geometry and its location on the globe. Um, so with that profile in hand, we then went in search of a target ecosystem and began to concentrate our search on the limestone cliff faces of the Hudson Valley that are immediately north of, of the city and really started to look at this plant species that were native to that environment, kind of with the theory that they would perform well in, in our environment. Um, so uh, the facade and the, and the rooftop and the gardens of the house really track the dimensions of that ecosystem from the forest floor to the cliff face to the cliff top. Um, and interestingly enough, in that ecosystem, there are also a number of native species that are on the federal endangered species list because they are losing their habitat um, due to climate change. So the garden facade really began to be an exploration into the, into the efficacy and also a kind of degree of agency that an individual building or individual building component might have on a planetary phenomenon like climate change um, and the loss of biodiversity. So we concentrated a lot of our energy around a particular species. Um, it's called known as the North American heart's tongue fern or splenium fern, um, which is one of these federal, federally endangered species. And in collaboration with the Landscape Architects Local Office um, and a team of conservation botanists at SUNY in Syracuse in the Graduate Forestry Department, um, we began to develop a strategy to propagate and plant the wall with, with um, species that included these endangered ferns. Um, I actually had to seek out a, a warrant from US Fish and Wildlife um, in, order, in order to do so. Um, so running parallel to this effort was a design effort um, to put the form of the planter itself at stake, um, looking at the three-dimensional texture of the facade, um, as well as the form of the planter unit and the shadows that it would, that it would cast below. Um, so the development of the facade's actual geometry really took these factors into account to coax out these ecological intensities, these sort of nano biomes um, 
that, that kind of tease out the environments of a limestone cliff face and then begin to compress those intensities, those kind of ecological intensities um, into a single 35 foot tall wall. Um, and then working with Boston Valley Terracotta, um, who are a manufacturer of terracotta facade systems, we developed a zero waste casting process to create the planter units um, themselves, which are then coated with a, with a pH neutral glaze and then kind of um, planted with a variety of native species. So um, a view, another view of the vertical garden sort of shortly after its initial planting, full of these really beautiful ferns who are also kind of a poster child for the threats of climate change. So um, one of the really interesting byproducts of this design research project um, is that the ferns had to be propagated outside of a laboratory environment um, for the first time with the help of commercial greenhouses. And, um, and that the quantity of ferns that we had to order meant that they were suddenly available commercially for propagation in other contexts. So part of the data that um, is being returned to, the, to our conservation partners in this garden um, concerns how different subspecies of the Esponian firm perform in this kind of garden setting to see if they can become commercially viable in the, in the marketplace and kind of creating another um, pathway out of, off of the endangered species list. So um, we've also recently started a project for uh, a ground up house in, in northern Westchester um, in, within the Croton, um, the Croton watershed, um, where we're also looking at creating similar kinds of supply chain linkages. Um, but th in this case, using timber from New York State and other Northeastern sources um, by kind of sourcing them from logs and trees that are taken down as part of the New York State Department of Conservation's efforts to help to manage the, the forests of, of New York State and kind of like certain, so certain trees have to be brought down for the health of the forest. Um, but, um, and we're collaborating with a, with a fellow GSEP alum and Professor Lindsay Wickstrom, um, uh, as well as Silman um, on the engineering side to create a, a hyper-local timber supply chain where one doesn't presently exist. Um, kind of taking measure of how the fruits of that supply chain might also inform the form of the building instead of the other way around. Um, so the, the building itself is a series of kind of pavilion-like volumes that are unified under, under a very thin wing-like wing roof. Um, so the structure is, the roof is, is structured and then clad in timber and it's supported by these, by these um, kind of ceramic clad volumes um, that uh, lift the roof above an elevated courtyard. Um, you can see in this, this, this concept model on the, on, on the left. Um, and, um, and then you get a sense of sort of like these pavilion like volumes and this kind of manifold timber clad roof um, with, with, with floors um, also in, in glazed terracotta. Um, so um, I think like uh, one of the interesting kind of opportunities um, in projects like these, because you know, we, we do so many projects for individuals or kind of individual clients. And that is that in each of these projects there, we've been looking for opportunities that the projects afford to kind of link them durably to, to larger systems or kind of planetary phenomena. Um, and then kind of find find the find the imprint of those systems in the in the individual buildings as a way of kind of sort of sussing out where where these you know these residential projects or kind of interior projects have have an opportunity to have agency uh, uh, within those larger contexts. Um, and then at the same time, we've been doing research sort of like on some of those larger phenomena to try to link them back to to individuals. So this is um, one example of that. Um, uh, so this is uh, an image of the Empire State Building um, uh, and they're kind of specifically the, the spire of the Empire State Building, which was sort of famously designed as a mooring for airships, um, but really has been home to broadcast infrastructure since the very beginning. Um, the, the building was, was home to RCA and its, and its uh, exper early experiments in television from the 1930s 30s onward. And, and really like, except for a brief period after um, Kind of uh, in in the, in sort of like the the, the 80s eighties um, since nine eleven the Empire State Building has also been the primary broadcast point for um, the entire metropolitan region again um, and so uh, we we've been sort of really fascinated in 
kind of the, the relationship that urban forum has to the technologies of broadcast, um, at, particularly as they move from kind of traditional broadcast to mobile, um, kind of thinking about how the ultra visible sort of iconic form of New York City, which is literally that of an antenna, um, uh, begins to kind of be dematerialized as, as we move, uh, as we shift to a kind of a, a similar but, but essential infrastructure that is, that is entirely secret and, and entirely privately owned, um, which is the mobile phone infrastructure, which is really only visible um, in the ways that it rubs up against kind of other other indices or other units of measure like FAA databases or kind of um, protests, you know, when, when tenants kind of like protest their landlords installing antennas on their, on their rooftops. Um, so we um, created a series of events uh, kind of looking or kind of walking around the city with, with academic groups like, you know, that we, that we call these antenna spotting events, like trying to, trying to kind of um, understand the distribution of mobile phone antennas um, on roof on rooftops. Um, and we also went in search of a kind of electronic registration. Um, so this is data that's pulled from a single Android phone um, using an antenna tracking app um, to kind of log which antennas um, that phone communicated with over the course of the day. And, and ultimately we, we kind of, that, the research sort of culminated in the, in, um, in the kind of scraping of, of building permit data, um, specifically a kind of electrical, electrical permit category that pertains exclusively to mobile phone infrastructure. Um, and so this is a map that we created that was, um, that was exhibited at the BNLI in 2012 um, in the American Pavilion. Um, of all 14,472 uh, mobile, mobile phone antennas in New York City at the time, um, kind of cross-referenced against the, the age and height of the building that they're, that they're on, which really begins to be a kind of a portrait of this, um, of this infrastructure and kind of like it's, and how tightly mapped it is to the, to the, the, form, of the, the form of the city. Um, So um, one of the really interesting collaborations that sort of then emerged out of that research, which we thought was just like a kind of interesting way of trying to find other registrations of um, this kind of communication technology um, is that uh, since 2016, well, beginning in 2016, we were contacted by City Bike um, about a partnership because the bike stations communicate on mobile phone uh, networks. And so since, 2016, we've been we've been engaged in a kind of data sharing arrangement with with City Bike um, to provide to provide um, data data kind of mapping layers and and also insight about the about the mobile phone infrastructure to help them to position their stations more intelligently and to help them to grow the system. And then sort of switching gears, kind of back to the interiors, we've also been um, a couple of years ago, we were contacted by a, a donor who was interested in making a library, um, a children's library, inside of a, a shelter called Concourse House, which is a, a shelter that serves women and young children who are transitioning out of, out of homelessness. It's based, um, it's located on the Grand Concourse um, in, um, in sort of the Kingsbridge, Kingsbridge section of the Bronx. Um, so the, the library is located on a mezzanine above a, a former chapel in the, in the shelter. And it's, and it's sort of unique in this facility as a, as a space that is specifically dedicated to reading and, and storytelling and, and imagination. Um, and it's, it serves by, by and large a population of children who don't um, actually own their own books. So the project itself is, is largely a, a shelving um, element and study tables for a reading and, and homework. Um, and this extremely graphic carpet that we collaborated with the artist Alex Proba on um, that sort of very loosely indicates different functional zones, like a, a spot on the floor that is appropriate for sitting in a circle and um, for, uh, for hearing a story. There's also this wall of upholstered elements that can be brought out for, collect for collective events and for seating, but that when stashed, um, it creates a, a really soft upholstered surface that, that um, makes sitting on the floor and reading a book comfortable. Um, 
So the geometry of these elements themselves is sort of cuddly um, with integrated lighting to brighten up the space, which was, which was obviously quite dark before. Um, <clears throat> and it's also a scale that, that works as a kind of uh, a guardrail or a balustrade um, uh, between this space and the double height space below, beyond, um, but also to make it much more approachable um, for, for young children. So this is a project that we did on a pro bono basis, um, and it's been one of the most instructive and sort of eye-opening aspects of that project um, was a parallel effort that we engaged in to solicit donations and raise money to support the fabrication and the resourcing and the decoration of the project. Um, and uh, so it, in this sense, there was a kind of expanded field of practice that, that, that emerged beyond the design beyond the territories of design proper, um, where we had agency uh, and could make a contribution. Um, so we organized uh, a number of fundraising efforts, a, a couple of events um, in our studio, as well as, an, and then we also kind of, um, we created an online auction um, on Artsy and Petal 8, um, featuring sort of ultra high-end design objects from sort of many of our friends and collaborators in the, in, in New York, in the in the design industry, um, that was uh, that were auctioned off to create an endowment um, to support the ongoing maintenance and, and supplying of, of the library once the sort of initial um, donor involvement began to be, began to um, fall off. Um, and uh, and I think one of the most kind of potent takeaways from this project um, has really been our capacity to kind of act in that in that manner, um, and also the fact that it wasn't that hard. Um, it sort of produced an enormously satisfying kind of um, impact on, on the lives of this very needy community, um, which has really informed our subsequent pro bono work and, and also the formation of design advocates. So um, in late last March, um, right as the COVID crisis, crisis would be good, was beginning to unfold in a really serious way, um, I was really, afraid um, for myself, but also, and, and for my team, but also for the, for the workers and the other biz design businesses that we, that we frequently collaborate with. So the origins of Design Advocates was, was actually a few Instagram stories um, that I had posted at the time looking for friends in the community, in the design community that we could talk to about sort of doing something. Um, uh, because it was beginning to be very clear to us that COVID-19 posed a series of problems that were sort of um, highly, extremely spatial and architectural in nature um, because it concerns our ability to be in space like with each other. Um, and we began to think that architects might somehow be uniquely qualified to be helpful. Um, so uh, also in, in, in the in the United States and also in particularly in New York as the crisis was unfolding amid kind of the utter absence of any form of organized federal response or, or plan um, and amid conflicting and limited guidance from the state and city. Um, it was also, as these maps show, um, sort of disproportionately and somewhat horrifyingly impacting low-income communities and communities of color. Um, because of course, as, as the crisis was running out of control, as we all know, it also coincided with this nationwide reckoning over racial injustice um, and police violence against communities of color. And as a sort of queer BIPOC person myself, like that was something that resonated with me deeply. And um, so that's the sort of context for design advocates and the, and the twin issues that we felt compelled to engage in, 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 a, in, a, in a sort of productive way. So the impetus for the small group of us who got together at that time um, may initially have been to help each other, um, but it but the mission of the of the organization really came into focus as we began to observe a real need to help other businesses and organizations to connect the dots between the fairly broad and uncoordinated guidance around COVID nineteen um, that was out there. Um, in, in, in sort of the atmosphere and, and what that guidance meant for individual spaces and communities and businesses, um, as well as other nonprofits and, and public institutions. So our objective has been to help to convert some of the general governmental, technical and public health guidance um, that's out there into implementable action um, for individuals and to help them pro bono to adapt their spaces and operations to the pandemic and beyond. So from the beginning of the pandemic until the present, there was this kind of enormous reluctance on the part of many actors, whether they're professional or, 
or whether public or professional, to really step into the fray at, at that particular scale. Um, there was a, there's always been a kind of a preference towards high level guidance um, over, over direct and individualized aid. And that gap um, we feel has contributed to, uh, that there's a, there's, so there's an important gap between, between expertise and implementation, um, which continues to be present and, and frankly dangerous everywhere. Um, especially in, in communities um, that are disadvantaged or communities of color who have not always had the most positive experiences working with or have, had, or have not necessarily had access to design professionals um, and who have also been the hardest hit by the pandemic and its sort of collateral and long-term impacts. So as an organization that's primarily made up of small firms, this is, this is sort of individualized help that we felt that we were particularly qualified and sort of set up to do. Um, and it also became, began to be a way to continue to collaborate and share what we were learning with each other and with other organizations. And then to, and then to in turn use that learning to develop partnerships and return insight from the field back to public agencies. Um, so we're interested in creating this sort of, this, this sort of productive and collaborative feedback loop where, where individual interventions are informed by expert guidance that then in turn promote equity and constituency building and communities of need that then return insight um, back to kind of the powers that be to inform future expert guidance and, and regulation. Um, so um, the design, the advocates part of design advocates also means that we're engaged in work with public agencies um, like the New York City Department of, of Education. So um, one of the things that we've done since the beginning um, are we've, we've developed these uh, four reopening plans for New York City public schools. Um, and so this is one uh, study that was done for PS34 in Brooklyn, um, uh, which is the oldest operating public school building in all of Brooklyn. You can see from the plan that it's, um, that it's an enfilade style building, like it's a, it's a railroad plan, um, meaning that there are no corridors and every classroom is accessed from another classroom. Um, which meant that the possible the possibility of a physical distancing or kind of the regulation of the of the student and staff population was almost impossible in in a building like this. Um, so uh, so the reopening plan is really actually just um, a kind of a color coding and circulation strategy that makes use of every single stairwell um, in the building and creates a series of pathways. Um, Kind of built around the 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 school's A B kind of constituent um, or kind of cohort structuring, which is like half of the school is present on one day and half of the school is present on another day, um, and simply creates routes and rooms that that different members of each cohort utilize, including the bathrooms, um, to ensure that one group of students can access their classroom without having to without having to pass through the room of another cohort. Um, and it was a kind of like a uniquely architectural problem solving uh, kind of enterprise um, that was then um, reinforced with color coding and signage, um, you know, kind of implement that could be implemented really simply. And as a result of this plan, we immediately received all this feedback from, from teachers and also parents um, telling us things like, I was really afraid of going back to school, but now that we have this plan, I, I know what, what we need to do and, and we've got it, like we can do this. And that was really, I think, proof positive for us at the very beginning of, of, this, of this effort that, this, that we were sort of on to, that we were sort of on to something. So um, this idea that design could be about communication and trust building, um, maybe even in advance of being about things and spaces, um, was something that started to inform many of our early efforts in design advocates. So um, part one of the one of the things that we were doing very early on is working with neighborhood restaurants. Um, and as a result of that work, um, we were asked to join the Neighborhoods Now effort, which was a which was a kind of initiative that was co-sponsored by the Van Allen and the Urban Design Forum um, to create teams of architects who would be working with community uh, community development organizations in organizations in the four neighborhoods of New York City that were the hardest hit by the pandemic. So this is um this is a brochure that we made um, 
that was distributed to restaurants in, in the Bronx. Um, because around this time, the city had created a program called Open Restaurants, um, which many of you probably know about, that enables restaurants to open outdoors in the, in the public way. So um, this was a way of kind of communicating to the community in advance about the existence of the program, because it really was not known, um, and kind of to tell them about elements that we could help them uh, help them with on a pro bono on a pro bono pro bono basis before we ever kind of set foot um, in the in the neighborhood and attempted to kind of like design anything. Um, and this is one of the projects that kind of came out of that effort. Um, it's a Dominican restaurant um, on Sedgwick Avenue called Tropical, um, and our kind of work on this project involved uh, a collaboration with two local artists, um, Felix and Dexter, Dexter Cyprian who grew up in the neighborhood and have then since returned um, to the Bronx to live, to live and work. Um, um, and they, uh, Dexter and, and Felix kind of work in collage um, and around themes of identity and, and memory. Um, and so they transformed what we had created for them, which is a sort of base infrastructure, which is very kind of like regulation friendly open restaurants, um, kind of traffic safety barrier. Um, and they kind of converted it into this phantasmagorical expression of Dominican thingies, like um, kind of uh, using sort of construction offcuts and, um, and, and paint and corrugated roofing to kind of create this, this um, really vibrant um, space for this, for this restaurant, um, which actually didn't really need a, an outdoor dining pavilion because it's really more of a takeout kind of restaurant. Um, and so the, the pavilion instead became nominally a sort of like outdoor dining room, but it also became a little bit of a community hub. Um, so there's a, so this is a digital projector, um, projection screen, and there's a projector that is um, used to display artwork and, and kind of community information. And it's, and it sort of was available for, for meetings and other kinds of community activities. And so this is sort of, um, this is some images from the opening. Um, and so like the, the idea that these kind of individualized street installations might be kind of powerful on a community basis is also organizing some of our research. Um, this is um, some images of a study that we're doing with Community Board 4 in Queens um, and a team of designers that includes the traffic safety and engineering group at Thornton Tomasetti. Um, we're basically, we're looking at how we could um, equip the community board with proposals for very selective street closures um, that they can bring to the Department of Transportation um, and how um, we could target uh, certain blocks that meet the criteria of the DOT in terms of selective um, pedestrianization as part of the kind of um, effort to create more accessible and equitable access to the outdoor space, but also where those street closures could be instrumental, not only to local, re local restaurants, but also because of their proximity to other institutions like libraries or public schools might be able to be, um, those street closures might be, able, may able, may, might be able to be leveraged to become more, a more kind of essential community resource. And um, one of our other kind of partnerships has been with the New York City Economic Development Corporation and the AIA um, to create a, a program that's called the Design Corps. Um, which is sort of design advocates in miniature. Um, it's, an, it's a program to partner individual restaurants with individual architects who can help them with some of the elements to, to enable them to open outdoors. Um, and it's a, a way of kind of taking some of the, the lessons that we've learned um, and kind of try to fold them into a citywide program. Um, and then kind of running in parallel with that, we've created a, a winterization retrofit toolkit um, that uh, kind of considers how the improved traffic safety um, kind of snow and wind um, kind of structural stability and heating and enclosure strategies could be, could be implemented to safely help to transition these provisional structures that were erected over the summer um, into kind of like the, into the winter and the, next, the following seasons now that the program has been made permanent. Um, so this is a this is a sort of initiative that we've been that we've been engaged in, kind of looking at at um, bringing engineering expertise to some of these really lightweight um, kind of temporary structures, 
Um, and also thinking <clears throat> specifically about how to incorporate other kinds of safety measures, um, you know, from sort of the incorporation of water filled um, traffic safety barriers to kind of safe strategies for reinforcement um, that are kind of really inexpensive and easily and easily um, implemented to, to kind of retrofit some of these structures um, to more kind of robust um, engineering expertise around around airflow. So we've kind of engineered a, a kind of enclosure strategy that um, that that triples that 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 sort of um, increases or augments the the ASHRAE standard for safe indoor air um, and kind of beats it by between 300 and 2000 um, percent. So um, all, all of the kind of as part of an effort to to improve sort of this, the safety and longevity of these of these outdoor elements, because we believe that that, that effort um, will serve the, the kind of durability of the program, um, which is currently and kind of really uh, incredibly caused a sort of reconsideration of the public space of the street and, and what that space is for and who it's for. And then kind of a last project, um, an arts project. This is a, this is, um, we've been working with a, a gallery in Williamsburg called Summertime um, on uh, kind of a retrofit of their space. And I will, um, and we've also been kind of as part of our efforts, um, creating these videos to, to spotlight the clients and the work that, of, um, the work that they, that they've been doing. So I'll let them explain the project in their, in their own words. Summertime is an art studio and gallery space in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, and we champion a more inclusive art world for artists with intellectual disabilities alongside artists without disabilities. The project that we're working on with Design Advocates is to make our gallery and studio space more accessible for artists, as well as transition from a studio to a gallery space seamlessly. One of the things we loved about working with design advocates was that working collaboratively is so central to their ethos and that's something that aligns perfectly with Summertime's mission. We did a participatory pinup with the artists that we work with as well as people in the neighborhoods, friends and colleagues where we invited them into our space to look at our designs, give us feedback and let us know what they would like in our space. We want Summertime's physical space to be a collaborative creative hub for all. Working with design advocates has had a huge impact on Summertime as an organization. And it's really the first time that we've been afforded the time and space to think about our design, both on an accessibility level, as well as making it a beautiful space. And that really perfectly aligns with how we want to support and exhibit the artists that we work with. The artists always come first. Um, and some images from the participatory, participatory, participatory pinup. Um, so, I mean, one of the interesting things about these kinds of um, projects is that all the design advocates projects are collaborations between multiple offices um, and clients. And so um, it's also kind of afforded us this really interesting opportunity to try out other forms of collaborative structure and kind of participatory design processes and um, kind of workflows that that we've maybe not had the opportunity or kind of like the projects in our in our respective offices don't necessarily afford, um, which has been, I think, one of the most kind of incredible learning experiences of, of um, from the organization. And as a result of that, like the collaborative teams are starting and the organization as a whole, um, I mean, we're just about to hit the one year mark. Um, and we are suddenly finding that our initial kind of premise, which was that which was that small firms shouldn't be limited to kind of thinking about small projects, um, is actually is is showing it's it's kind of proving to be true. So um, so kind of in a return to this antenna image, um, we've for example been recently um, we've started a collaboration with a, a group of telecom workers who've have kind of broken away from Spectrum to create a, a community sourced and worker owned alternative um, internet provider in New York City called People's Choice. And they have a contract to install internet um, connectivity infrastructure on 50 
starting with the 52 New York City Housing Authority buildings. So we're starting to be kind of asked to partner with organizations as well as city agencies um, to kind of think about more equitable distribution of, of essential infrastructure like internet connectivity for, for communities like the public housing community and for homeless shelters. And so this has been a really interesting um, kind of outgrowth of this collaborative um, energy that, that has really been kind of built into, into the organization. So um, these are the six firms who kind of started the, the group um, and some of the logos and kind of persona that, that have been involved in it um, over the course of the, of the last year. And that's it, thank you. Thank you, Michael. That was fantastic. Um, I'm, I'm inspired now so I can go do my studio work. This is great. Um, um, no, but seriously, to see such a diverse body of work, um, I would love to know how you manage all of that. And I mean, I don't know of any other firm or designer with uh, both like rich interiors, compact living design, socially conscious urban design interventions um, and academic research. So, I mean, that's, it's extremely unique. Um, and also to see what you're doing with design advocates is really exciting, especially living in New York City, I see um, how much need there is for that. So thank you. Um, uh, we have about 10 minutes, so um, we'll to, to have the Q&A. So that's, um, I'll go ahead and try to start the um, process. Um, so first question, uh, and please feel free to write anything in the chat as we go. Um, so first question is from Gary, and he says, Sir Michael, good day. Sir, may I ask, what would be your best tips to become a successful graduate in MARC at Columbia GSAP? And do we need to become more experimental or do we need to become more conventional and traditional? Um, so um, I guess my, that's a big question. Um, I think that my, my, my reply is probably something along the lines of, I think that you should do you. Um, but um, I can just say that from my own path, um, I, I think that, um, you know, I tried to, I was really deeply inspired by um, both the kind of critical training that I received at Columbia, as well as a sort of experimental um, kind of the spirit of kind of experimentation, particularly around, around digital technology um, that was kind of happening in the early aughts when I was, um, when I was in a mark. And, um, and, uh, and I, I guess like my career trajectory, certainly in the context of the office, has been to find as many applications of that training as as I as I as I could create um, in the sort of within the realm of, of of a conventionally structured, you know, sort of not especially novel practice model, you know, which is that like we are structured like a conventional architecture firm, um, and we do primarily built commissioned work, um, you know like much of it in New York City, right? And so trying to find ways for that context, um, like Park Avenue apartments, right? Which are, which are in a way some of the most traditional, most coded, most kind of rigid um, uh, project contexts for them to be hosts to some of the more kind of radical thoughts or kind of techniques or working methods um, that have sort of been let's say foundational to my own training as an architect. Like I find that to be an incredibly enriching um, environment to work in, right? Like, and, and sort of like an interesting challenge to, um, to, to engage in because it, what it means is that the, what it means is that, is that the people who are practitioners of those more experimental processes, digital fabrication, um, you know, kind of coders, programmers, um, as well as more experimental makers, it means that they are the ones who reap the profit from these projects. Um, and so that is a way of, I think, uh, kind of like an important form of, of community building um, and kind of capacity building that as an architect, we, I have, have sort of the privileged position of, of being able to, um, to kind of conduct, right? And so, so I think for me, it's about kind of connecting the dots. It was never really about, it was never really about choosing either or. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
That's fantastic. Yeah, I mean, to see the ceiling in the um, Fifth Avenue apartment, it's like, it's both like extremely contemporary, but it has like this traditional um, aspect to it. So it's really interesting. Um, so Chris has a really good question. Um, he says, thank you, Michael. I wanted to ask what's your vision. Oh, sorry. Now it's, it's moving on. Um, what's your vision for your firm in the next five to 10 years? And what do you hope to, to achieve? And I would also just add in there, how do you see um, design advocates um, playing into your role of like of your firm and, uh, over the next like five years? Yeah, I mean, well, I think, you know, so I'm like in my mid 40s, right? And so like, like, I feel like, I feel like for the for the firm, after a, you know, a decade or two of, of sort of striving, we're finally kind of hitting our, our professional stride. Um, and uh, that's been really powerful and kind of exciting for me personally, and also for the whole team. Um, and I think that that interestingly enough, like many of the opportunities that we've been afforded recently have kind of coincided with some of, with the advent of some of this more sort of civically minded, you know, kind of pro bono work, right? So kind of work with institutions that has led to other, has led to other things. And so in the, in part of the kind of ulterior motive um, behind design advocates was always to use the organization as a way to um, be a kind of a cheerleader for and a kind of a support mechanism um, and a resource for other small firms. Um, and so something that we are very much invested in right now as an organization is talking about how we can kind of transition from being more of a kind of like board led or kind of executive led organization to being a more member led organization that serves the, that, that kind of returns, shall we say profit or, or kind of benefit to the members, the volunteers who actually contribute their en the energy to, to the projects. And so as the profile of design advocates has been kind of on the rise um, over the course of the last year, and we're being asked to be sort of essential partners, kind of working on essential work for organizations and also for the city, like we're trying very much to, to use that as an opportunity to advocate for the, the importance of small firms or kind of independent firms and the sort of energy and, and, and expertise that, that resides within them. So I think that the hope is really that, that, the, that the two organizations are, are kind of mutually reinforcing in that, in that way, you know, like that, and that, um, and, it, and that, that benefit doesn't kind of like flow to me or, or my fellow board members, but it begins to really be kind of um, spread across the, the people who are, who are active in the, in the organization. Um, and I think that it's being, it, it is, you know, we have, we have sort of indications of, of proof of concept of, of that simply by virtue of the fact that we're like recently being kind of approached with, with, um, non pro bono kind of like paid work, you know, kind of work on infrastructure, work for larger institutions um, and kind of larger actors. Um, and so we think that there's an, we think that there's a really interesting opportunity here um, within within design advocates. I mean, and, and that sort of plays very well into my own ambitions for the practice, which is that we want to be making more buildings, we want to be making larger buildings, we want to do more work kind of in the public, in the public realm where some of the research capacities and and kind of technological capacities that we have in the office um, gain a foothold in sort of like the material world. Mm -hmm. um, I think when you showed the first slide, you said there was about like five firms together in in yourself uh, for design advocates. And how quickly did it grow to about the 120? I mean, it's probably like closer to 150 by now. And yeah. um, I mean, it was just like it's been just like a slow additive, you know. Um, process. So, I mean, we probably had like close to 300 people kind of like cycle through um, the organization at one point or another over the course of the last year. And I'd probably say that there's, there's probably like a, it's probably like a, a group of, of 30 or 40 firms who are really kind of core to the, um, to the, to the organization now and are doing a lot of work. Um, and how has the city responded? So when you do those like guides of the, um, like, ventilation and like um, street side um, eating, like how has the city responded? Have they been very helpful? They, they have, I mean, like, um, so the, the winterization guide is actually being released in conjunction with the Department of Transportation. So it's, it's um, it required quite a lot of um, back and forth 
um, with city agencies, you know, DOT, DOB, um, small business services. Um, and so I think um, that's been a very interesting kind of outgrowth of the whole experience as well as that, you know, we, we assumed that we would have the door slammed in our faces. And actually what we found is that the city is so desperate for people to step in um, that there, not only is there an opportunity to get involved, but there's actually an opportunity to help to, to kind of move the needle a little bit on what these what these various programs will mean down the line, especially as they become permanent. And so this is sort of like to me, this is the this is the holy grail, right? Is to is is for some of the people who've been who've been active in, in this process on a kind of pro bono and sort of self-organized level to be both recognized and also have agency um, in the context where the city is starting to consider like what or in what manner will will outdoor dining become a permanent feature of the of of the of the landscape of the street of New York City, and that that's that's a conversation that's happening right now, um, and so we're trying to exert as much pressure on that process as we can. Okay, um, and would you? It's already one o'clock, so would you be willing to answer one more question? Of course. Um, so, um, uh, Andrea says, uh, "Great presentation, um, thank you." And how do you find local artists like Dexter and Felix Ciprian? So. Um, so, uh, one of the amazing things about working with a, a team of 300 other designers is that we have an incredible network. That's the answer. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, Felix and Dexter are friends, like they're friends of friends. And, um, and, um, it's the same with kind of like the artists and designers that, um, that we work with in the, in the office, you know? Sometimes it's about people, sometimes it's about recognizing that there are just gems in your own network or kind of your extended network. Um, it, I think it's about teles, kind of telegraphing that, that um, at least for us in, in the office, it's been about telegraphing our desire for and kind of interest and commitment in collaboration. Um, and then we use platforms like Instagram, you know, like we find, we, we, we learn about people who are interesting to us. Um, we reach out, we um, kind of cultivate relationships, and then we try to find ways to get them paid, like down the line, right? We kind of look for paying opportunities or kind of commission opportunities um, and try to find ways uh, to, sh to kind of share the wealth. Like that's, I think, um, so I think you find partners by being a good partner. Mm -hmm. That's exciting. I mean, I could I could see then, um, you know, post COVID nineteen, maybe the design community, you know, becomes a little bit tighter in New York City through this whole process. I mean, I, I really hope so. I mean, like this has been one of the most miraculous things about design advocates, right? Is it like all of us? Like many of us are friends, right? Like a lot of us have associations with schools, or like we went to school together, or we teach together, um, and so we have kind of um, we have a certain kind of community that's that is that is built in, but but professionally we are kind of nominally in competition with one another all the time, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that doesn't mean that we're not still friends, of course, because we're architects and our friends are all architects. Um, but um, but we've never been able to we've never had the opportunity to collaborate with each other in quite the same way, and so it has been kind of magical. Like it's been a really wonderful experience. It's kind of like my favorite thing that I've worked on in the last year is, is sort of like this, you know, this kind of like ragtag team of, of, um, of fellow designers in, in New York where we get together on Zoom and on Miro and kind of like work on these amazing projects for these amazing communities. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. That was such a great note to, to end on. I wish we had more time, um, but I want to thank Michael and Nash for bringing more awareness to what uh, the GSAP community does um, in the city and beyond. And hopefully we can have Michael back for an update on all his projects and design advocates in, in the future. But um, I have dropped some links in the chat to stay in touch with Michael and for updates with his firm, as well as participating in upcoming um, GSAP lectures. So thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you.